Thank you, Senator Day. Senator Back. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> I rise to express my condolence uh, at the passing away on Monday of this week uh, of past Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, and extend that sympathy to his family and indeed to the people of Singapore. It was his oldest son, <clears throat> now Prime Minister uh, Lee Sin Lung, uh, who said on the death of his father the other morning, and I quote, the first of our founding fathers is no more. He inspired us, gave us courage and brought us here. To many Singaporeans and indeed others too, Lee Kuan Yew was Singapore. Uh, and I join with those comments by uh, Prime Minister Lee. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew had a most interesting history. Born in 1923, he was 91 years of age when he passed away. Obviously, he was uh, in Singapore as a young man uh, during the Japanese occupation. Uh, actually had an interaction with the Japanese and eventually was able, I think, to escape uh, from uh, the activities associated with the Japanese occupation. Uh, he then went to the London School of Economics uh, and obtained uh, a degree in law from Cambridge University. Uh, he was very, very active in the trade union movement at the time, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, and on his return to Singapore uh, formed the uh, party of which he was the leader uh, for much of his adult life. Uh, and indeed, in 1959, uh, was able to lead uh, the negotiations uh, for independence from Britain. In 1963, uh, Singapore merged with uh, Malaysia to become Malaya, and only two years later, uh, indeed, he took Singapore away from that relationship. Uh, and indeed, uh, it does uh, it, uh, enjoy or celebrate its 50th anniversary as an independent country on the 9th of August this year. Uh, and it's somewhat ironic that Lee Kuan Yew did not live long enough to actually be there for the 50th anniversary. What is his legacy, Madam Acting Deputy President? Well, he took an island which is only one third the size of the ACT from a very backward, third world, underdeveloped country, and he simply jumped it across uh, the agrarian, across the industrial, and created it as a first world high IT tech country. And it would be fair to say that it was the shadow cast by Lee Kuan Yew uh, that was largely responsible for that incredible transition. Between the years 1960 and 1980, the gross national product of Singapore increased some 15-fold, which was an amazing result. On his retirement as Prime Minister in 1990, a period of some 31 years. He was indeed the longest serving Prime Minister in the world. Uh, he passed over the Prime Ministership to Prime Minister Go Chok Tong in 1990, uh, and the position of Minister Mentor was created. And then, when his own son, now Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung, became Prime Minister in 2004, if I recall correctly, uh, he uh, was given the title Senior Minister. And of course, many believe even from beyond the grave, uh, Lee Kuan Yew will continue to have a profound effect uh, on Singapore and indeed on the region. I ask you to reflect again on the fact that he had responsibility for an island only one third that of the Australian Capital Territory. No natural resources, no capacity for agriculture, little opportunity indeed for there to be any industrial development, a shortage of water uh, on the island. He had to negotiate, despite the tensions uh, when Singapore split from Malaysia, had to negotiate that there would continue to be a water pipeline uh, from Malaysia across the causeway into Singapore. And I believe even to this day, uh, water of a lesser quality is piped from the Malaysian mainland into Singapore, where it is value added. Uh, where it is treated and where, indeed, at a higher price, water is sold back to Malaysia. Singapore now has a population of some 5.5 million people with a tremendously harmonious society, not the case when he first took responsibility for that island state. Approximately 75 per cent ethnic Chinese, around 13 per cent Malay, 10 per cent Indian uh, and a smaller number of others. Madam Acting Deputy President, 
Despite such a small island with no natural resources, it has one of the highest per capita incomes in the world. Indeed, I think the current per capita uh, GDP of Singapore is some $63,000. Singapore has one of the highest sovereign wealth funds anywhere in the world, and it has been this that has allowed Singapore uh, to be able to withstand uh, many of the economic and other crises that have befallen much of Asia, simply because of the tremendous security uh, that has been attached to that country. Uh, I can tell you from my own experience, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, having been Chief Executive Officer of a company with uh, an office in Singapore through the much of the last decade, what a wonderful place Singapore is to do business. There is no corruption in Singapore. The work ethic of Singaporeans <laughs> is very, very high. The quality uh, of the finished product, particularly in the IT space, is enviable. And if I can refer back to my colleague Senator Day's comments in the last few minutes, both the company and the personal tax rate in Singapore is 15 per cent. 15 per cent makes it very, very attractive for people to live and to work in that country. Madam Acting Deputy President, it's interesting, under the influence uh, of the Singapore government, particularly through the Singapore Housing Development Board, uh, in excess of 90 per cent of adult Singaporeans are living in the home that they either own, Mr President, or are buying through their provident fund. More than 90 per cent of adult Singaporeans are in their own home. And we've had the debate in this place in recent times about what an aspiration it would be if only we could move in that direction for Australians. In terms of a place to live, again, I speak from a personal point of view. Three, all three of my children resided in Singapore until three or four years ago when two left to go to the United States and my middle son remains in Singapore and has a business uh, in that country, which is absolutely flourishing. I can tell you what a safe place it is. My wife and I would often visit our daughter, who did not know where her front door key was, simply because nobody locks their front doors in Singapore. Isn't that an incredible reflection in contrast to here in Australia? If you leave a mobile phone in a taxi, Mr President, generally by the time you realise that you've left your mobile phone, the taxi driver has returned to the location where they dropped you off and the phone is there waiting for you. So what is the miracle that Lee Kuan Yew established for his country? Certainly on the negative side there would be those who said he was far too dictatorial. And young Singaporeans today resist uh, that level uh, of interference uh, in the day-to-day -day lives. But of course their parents would say this was a man who took us from an underdeveloped third world country to a first world highly IT economy. But we know of course it is a transport hub. All of us who have flown to Europe would know of the quality of the Singapore airport, consistently judged the best airport in the world. Shipping and shipping logistics, the tonnage of shipping that actually goes through the port of Singapore. In terms of movement of containers, the port of Singapore remains the world benchmark in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. We know that Singapore uh, is an excellent banking, industrial uh, and insurance uh, country. And in fact, Australia interacts and engages continually with that country. All of it, much of it, the legacy of Lee Kuan Yew. I speak, of course, uh, as a Western Australian because of the closeness of the association between Singapore and our home state. Uh, those of us associated in any way with higher education in WA would know of the very high proportion of Singaporean students uh, who have been at our colleges of advanced education and our universities and retain and maintain that very, very close link with Singapore as a result. Mr President, Lee Kuan Yew was a tower throughout the region. He was a close friend of Australia. He was very influential in China, 
uh, and its direction over time, and I, for one, think the world is poorer for his absence. Thank you, Senator Baxter.